Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crossroads. Welcome guests and members. Um, we're really excited to have you here today. Uh, my name is Jeff Dickett. I am your MC for today. I'm a member of the leadership community here. Um, if you don't have a program, everybody should have one of these. Raise your hand and an usher will bring you one. So just a couple things before we get started. Um, the exits, we have two exits here on the sides of the church, and the two exits uh, in the foyer and then down the end of the hall. Bathrooms are towards the, uh, the hallway to your left. Uh, we have free coffee and refreshments in the Hope Cafe, which is right out here in the foyer on your left. We also have a prayer room, so if you feel that you'd like to have some prayer and um, have people pray with you today, either during the van or during our breaks. It's right out this door to your right. Uh, we call it a special place. There'll be prayer teams there for you. Um, and then uh, we have ushers and security around. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. They're the ones walking around with the really nice sport coats on. Um, and so we have Chris. Chris is gonna do some worship for us and then we'll get started. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. great, thanks Jeff. Well, good morning everybody. Good to see you here. Why don't we stand together as we'll just begin with a, with a couple of songs of praise and worship. And I just have a scripture that I want to read from, uh, from Nehemiah. It says, stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. For you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Amen. Lord, we just thank you this morning for life, Lord, that comes from you. Jesus, you are the maker of all things, and today, Lord, we just acknowledge you for who you are and what you did, and we have the opportunity to gather here to learn and to grow together, um, Jesus, and, and we're just so thankful for that opportunity. Lord, we just come before you, and we just want to lift up a couple of worship songs to you this morning to, uh, to say you're welcome here and open up the heavens, and we want to see you and experience you today at this conference. So we love you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And everyone said, amen. 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 Join with us as we worship the Lord.
Frida and all of her team for really making this possible. Frida, would you just wave to everybody? She's amazing. Every church needs a Frida. Can you say that with me? Every church needs a Frida. That's right. And every community needs a Neil Boron. Would you agree with that? Praise the Lord. Neil, would you just... Why does Neil stand up? I know he said I'm not going to stand up, but this is Neil... Praise the Lord for Neil, wow, and his wife, Mary, who puts up with him all the time. He's just a great guy, though. What a great personality, and what a great gift to our community. Um, we have 62 different churches and ministries signed up to be here today, and that's pretty major. 62, with about 275 that signed up now. I don't see 275 here. I know there's a lot of sickness going on. And, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing for Western New York, but it's also a good thing for the kingdom of God. Last night I met Scott for the first time, and I took him out to dinner in Buffalo, New York. Now, what do you order when you live in Buffalo, New York? For the, or you come for the first time, right? So he checked the list, and he said, do you have any pizza? And they had these little pizza rolls. I said, you really don't want to eat those. How many of you agree with that? You do not want to eat a pizza roll. Praise the Lord you didn't eat that. You wouldn't be here this morning. You would still be in the hotel. So I thought, well, something else. Chicken wings. Seriously? I don't know. So anyway, he asked me, he said, um, he's an author, and I have this, aspiration to write a few books. And so I said, I'd like to write a book. He said, well, what would it be on? And I said, well, I would title it The Forgotten Covenant. I had him. That's a hook. Well, what's that? And I said, The Covenant of Salt. Well, he knew a little bit about it because he's just a really bright guy. I mean, you'll see that in just a minute. You are going to be bright this morning, right? No, he's not going to be. <laughs> He's a really bright guy, and I said, well, he said, what is that? What, you know, and I said, you know, it's an, really, it's mentioned three times in the Old Covenant, um, but the principles of it are brought into the New Covenant by Jesus himself. In fact, in Matthew 5, he says, you're the salt of the earth. If salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be thrown under, thrown out and trampled on by man. You know that scripture? It says, you're the light of the world. No one lights a lamp and puts, it, puts a bushel over it, but we allow it to be shown, why? To give him glory and praise. And I said, that brings it into the New Testament. And I said, Neil, or Neil, I'm sorry. I love you, Neil, that's why I keep referring. <laughs> I said, Scott, I said, that's really who we are. We're salt and light. And most people think salt is a preservative, but I believe that it goes deeper than that. Salt is a compound that is made up of sodium and chloride, or sodium and chlorine. Individually, they're very deadly. Separated, they're deadly. Do you know that? 
One of the challenges in the church of Jesus Christ is that we're separated. And in some ways, we become deadly. You know, we fight against each other. We are divided and we're separated. But when sodium and chloride are brought together, they share their electrons and become almost inseparable. They become salt, which is life. And that's what God has called us to be. He's called us to be salt. He's called us to be life and to be givers of life. And as we come together like we are today and as we hear this amazing message of life, amen, we become salt and we become powerful because we then become light. You see, you can't be light without first being salt. That's why it's so important that you're here today. That's why it's so important that really the Lord sent Scott to Western New York to come here today to bring us together with this incredibly important message, the message of life. There's no more important message than that. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. And so he sends a man like this with a message of life. And last night, every time you touch him, it just oozes out of him. He just, he has that message. It's in him. It's his, it's his life. It's what he, what he does. And God has brought him here to Western New York. Are you excited? I mean, come on. He's here. He's here, right? He's in Western New York. And it's exciting. And good things are happening. If you look at what's happening in our region, in our area, you're going to see the impact of this. You're going to take seeds with you back, and you're going to plant them. They're going to grow, and they're going to bear fruit. And uh, he already said to me last night, I'm coming back. So, and he just got here. So it's western New York. We're really gracious people, aren't we? Aren't we gracious people? So we're going to graciously welcome him right now. Would you welcome Scott to western New York? Come on. Praise the Lord. My name is Neil, and I'm thrilled to be here today. <laughs> Pastor Pat has gone beyond what's required to make this happen. I am thoroughly thankful for you and what you have done. Thank you for setting this up. How many of you have ever been in an argument with your spouse or kids or significant other? You are winning. The Lord knows you're winning the argument. Any rational mind in the universe knows you're winning the argument, and the person you're talking to changes the subject. Can I see your hands? How many of you? There's a whole lot of married people lying right now. Come on. Now, let me ask it a different way. How many of you, when you've been losing the argument, you knew you were losing the argument? The Lord knew you were losing the argument, and you changed the subject. How about a little, all right, a little better, a little better. Today, we're going to talk about a topic where people change the subject. And of course, that topic is abortion. Let me give you an example. A number of years ago, one of my favorite philosophers, comedian Roseanne Barr, said the following, quote, you know who I can't stand? It's them people who are anti-abortion. I hate them. They're nothing but a bunch of perverted, geeky old men who want you to just keep spitting out kids so they can molest them, end quote. Okay, Roseanne, you're right. You're right. The entire pro-life movement is nothing but a bunch of perverted old men, including the women amongst us. You're right. How does it follow that A, the unborn are not human, or B, we may intentionally kill them. 
What did Roseanne do? Just change the subject. She didn't keep the main thing the main thing. And men and women, what we're going to do before you leave here today, uh, when we get done around 7 o'clock tonight, what's going to (laughs) happen, that was a joke, an attempt to bond with my audience, and it went down faster than the bills. But anyway, moving along. (laughs) Oh, now I'm really in trouble. Oh, boy. (laughs) Seminar over. (laughs) Don't worry, I'm not a Dolphins fan, okay? Yeah, yeah. I hate the Dolphins. Does that help? Yeah. I'm a Rams fan, so I'm in mourning right now, just so you know, all right? Um, Before you leave here today, you are going to know how to keep the main thing the main thing. And here's what else you're going to know how to do. You're going to know how to simplify this issue to bring it down to the one question that really matters so that people don't distract you by changing the subject. You're also going to learn how to make a persuasive case for the pro-life view using language and arguments that people out there who reject religious authority will be able to resonate with. And then third thing you're going to learn how to do, you're going to learn how to get out of the hot seat, how to handle objections that are thrown your way. And I have very good news for you today. You do not have to have a PhD to succeed at this. You do not have to have a graduate degree. You don't even have to have a high school degree to succeed at what we're going to talk about today. All you need to do is what my friend Greg Kolkel says, put a pebble in their shoe. You ever had a pebble in your shoe when you're out hiking? It just wears on you and wears on you. We're going to teach you today how to dispense pebbles, to give people something to think about, which will also include how to ask good questions. Now, I don't know how many of you are, how do I put this delicately? chronologically gifted enough to remember the television show Columbo. Any of you remember Columbo? Okay. For those of you that are too young to remember, the holy trinity of Sunday night television in the early 1970s was Columbo, McLeod, and McMillan and Wife. All came on after Disney and Lassie. That was the 1970s. It was dismal. But Columbo was a bright spot. And we're going to talk about how you take a tip from Lieutenant Columbo and asking questions when you feel like you're on the hot seat. So those are the skills you're going to leave here with today. So let's get started, and let's start right away with the three most important words. By the way, I've noticed a few of you are already taking notes faster than broke people at a Dave Ramsey seminar, and I want you to know (laughs) that um, we're going to supply you... That was another bad joke, Pat. It's... You teach Dave Ramsey here? I love Dave Ramsey. He's right about everything, pretty much. So, uh, good. Uh, Here's what I want you to know. If you don't want to take any notes, you don't have to. And here are your two options for avoiding notes. At the back book table, I have resources, which we will talk to you about, that if you purchase our resource pack today, you go home, you'll not only know this stuff frontwards and backwards, you'll be able to teach it in your churches. So that's available. The second thing, because I'm such a nice guy, I mean, I really am, I have actually taken the trouble of printing out for you detailed notes on what I'm going to talk about today. Meaning, you do not have to take notes because everything I say is going to be in those notes. Now, those notes have been posted on a website which we are not going to give out to you until the end of the day. Because some of you, I know human nature. Oh, he gave us the notes. Honey, let's check out. Let's go to McDonald's and have breakfast. First mistake. And what we'll do is we, we will... By the way, the McDonald's here is like three times the price of the normal average. I learned that yesterday. I had to make a house payment to buy a Big Mac. It was unreal. Now, these notes that we're going to give you are so thorough, but we're not going to give the the notes out till the end of the day. I'm going to tell you how to get them online because some of you will be tempted to leave. And if you do, you'll lose your salvation. It's that simple. (laughs) And I'm a Calvinist saying that, so you're, you're in trouble, all right? Now, these notes are so thorough that you will be able to recall. And if you combine it with the products we got available, uh, you will be set to really make a difference. So let's talk about the three most important words for a pro-life apologist. An apologist is someone who makes a case for what he or she believes. It's not someone who runs around and says he's sorry all the time. 
That's what parents of teenagers do. This is someone who makes a case for what they believe. Here are the three most important words. Word number one, syllogism. You're going, wait a minute, the coffee's not even kicking in yet, and you're throwing Greek at me. Syllogism, you use them all the time. A syllogism is a proper form of an argument. Premise, premise, conclusion. Here's an example. Socrates was a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Here's one you've used on your kids. Dad, I want to use the car Friday night. You say, son, you will not be using the car Friday night. Why not? Well, son, we made an agreement. Your driving privileges are predicated upon getting good grades. There's premise one. Premise two, you did not get good grades. Therefore, you will not be driving Friday night. That's a syllogism. We use them all the time. And the pro-life argument is put in a syllogism that, as I will show you when we're done here today, will keep you on message, keep you from people like Roseanne, distracting you from the main thing. It keeps you on message. Second most important word for a pro-life apologist, syllogism. Anybody want to guess what the third one's going to be? Yeah, you got it, syllogism. Now, why would I say this? Because we're in a world that wants to just constantly change the subject. So here is your pro-life syllogism. Here's the argument I want you to stick to like glue. Ready? Premise one. It is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. It is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, what's the conclusion going to be? Abortion is wrong. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that, therefore it's wrong. Now notice, we have an argument here. An argument is a syllogism put forward to make a case. Now maybe our case is wrong, I don't believe it is, but to refute it, you can't just change the subject. You can't just attack someone personally. You've gotta deal with the actual argument they've just made, and by making an argument like this, we keep the main thing the main thing, and we don't get distracted. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that, therefore, it's wrong. And we're going to defend that syllogism with science and philosophy, and we're going to learn how, how to handle the most common objections to that syllogism. So let's go ahead and look at three framing questions that will help us defend this syllogism. And again, this is all going to be in your notes. Here is the first question we need clarity on. What is the unborn? We also need clarity on the second question we're going to look at. What makes us valuable as human beings? And then we'll look at the third question. What's the point? What is the unborn? What makes us valuable? What's the point? You get these three questions clear in your mind, you're, you're ready to sail. You're ready to make a difference where God places you. So let's look at that first question. What is the unborn? I want you to imagine you are standing at your kitchen sink, you are washing dishes after supper, your back is turned to your five-year-old son or grandson who comes in while you're scrubbing away at the kitchen sink there with your back turned, and that little five-year-old pipsqueak says to you, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? Some of you are going, wait, cute little boys would never ask that question. Let me enlighten you. This ring on my finger says I've been married to the most glorious woman in all of Christendom for 34 years. We have a son, 28. We have a son, 27. We have a son, 22. We have a daughter, 18. I have personally heard the question, Daddy, can I kill this more times than I can count, nearly always with his hands around his brother's throat when he's asking the question. <laughs> What's the first words out of your mind or out of your mouth, I should say, when you hear that little voice say, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? What's the first thing you're going to ask? Not no, that's an answer. What's the first question you need an answer to? Not why. What is it? What has he got? Cockroach, snail, smash it, do not show your mother. Neighbor kitty, whoa. Brother by the throat, you have issues. Get counseling, right? 
You would never in a billion years say, sure, son, have at it, until you answered that predicate question, what has he got? You know what we just did? We just solved the abortion issue. Can we kill the unborn? The answer is yes. If. If what? If the unborn are not human. If morally speaking, abortion is no different than a surgical procedure that removes a mole, I don't care how many you have. I don't care. But if it's intentionally killing an innocent human being, we have a lot to talk about right now. You can't answer the question, what is the unborn? Or you can't answer the question, can we kill the unborn, until you answer the question, what is the unborn? And that is precisely the question our culture wants to ignore. Did Governor Cuomo, in any of his justifications for the law he signed here a couple of months ago, give any justification, any argument to show the unborn are not human beings? No. He talked about choice. He talked about privacy. He talked about trusting women to make their own personal decisions. He talked about not imposing his personal religious beliefs on others who might disagree. He talked about everything under the sun but the one question he should have answered, what is the unborn? He entirely ignored that. And by the way, that's nothing new. How many of you have read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? You remember that book? I'm gonna take you back a long time, perhaps. In chapter 32, there's a remarkable exchange that takes place. Huck Finn has been out in one of his adventures. He happens on the property of Aunt Sally, now, Aunt Sally is a little bit mixed up. She sees Huck coming down the road, and she rushes out to him thinking it's Tom Sawyer. And she says to Huck, where have you been? My boy, where have you been? We've been waiting for you all this time. What has taken you so long? And Huck doesn't know what to do. He's just a kid. So he makes up a story. Well, ma'am, we, 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 we were on a steamboat, and, and you know, uh, it, it blew a cylinder head. That's what happened. Aunt Sally says, my gosh, was anybody hurt? No, ma'am. It killed a Negro, but nobody got hurt. Well, that's good, said Aunt Sally, because sometimes people do get hurt. What was just assumed about the black man? That he wasn't one of us. Was it argued for? It was simply assumed. Five years ago, the President of the United States, celebrating Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court case that gave us abortion through all nine months of pregnancy, when you look at Roe and its companion case, Doe v. Bolton, you see that abortion, for all practical purposes, was made legal through all nine months of pregnancy. Celebrating that date on January 22nd, five years ago, the then President of the United States said the following, today is a day that all Americans should celebrate. Oh, why is that, Mr. President? Listen to his words. Quote, because this is a nation where everyone gets to pursue their own dreams, end quote. Mr. President, with all due respect to your office, does, quote, everyone, unquote, include the unborn? Do they get to pursue their own dreams? Notice he simply assumed the unborn weren't human. He didn't argue for it. He simply assumed it. The great Christian apologist C.S. Lewis once observed that the most dangerous threats to Christianity are not those ideas that are spelled out clearly against our faith. If Lewis were alive today, he would tell us Christian your biggest problem is not Richard Dawkins, the atheist philosopher from Oxford. Your biggest problem is not Daniel Dennett. Your biggest problem is not Sam Harris, who wrote letters to a Christian nation. Your biggest problem is not ex-Christians who suddenly decide they're atheists and decide that Christianity is bunk, like Rachel Held Evans. Rather, your biggest problem our ideas the culture simply assumes to be true and never critically analyzes. And one of the biggest ideas out there is the idea, the assumption, that the unborn 
are not human. And you hear this assumption and virtually every piece of street-level pro-abortion rhetoric you hear out there. Turn on the media at night, read your newspapers, turn on CNN, either their website or just watch them, and up and down the script, you're going to see, whenever the topic is abortion, assumptions that the unborn are not human. They will not be argued for, they will be simply assumed. So, for example, you're talking to a friend, and a friend says to you, why don't you trust women to make their own personal decisions? Stop right there. What's the typical pro-life response to that? What is it? Well, we love women. Why? We do everything we can for them. No, 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 no. Wrong answer. We do love women. We do want to make that point. But that's not the primary problem with the objection you just heard. The primary problem is the assumption with it. Would anybody you know argue we should be allowed to kill four-year-olds in the name of trusting parents to make their own personal decisions? Yes or no? No. So why do they argue that way with the unborn? What are they assuming about the unborn that they're not assuming about the four-year-old? That they're not human. It hasn't been argued for. It's simply assumed. So how do we, as pro-lifers, expose that, ex that assumption? We're going to use a tactic we call trot out the toddler. Now let me explain what trot out the toddler is. It is not, and please make note of this, this will be in your notes, but make, make note of it now. It is not used to argue that just like the toddler is human, so is the unborn. No. We use trot out the toddler to frame the debate around the question, what is the unborn? It's a framing device, not an argument device. He or she who frames the issue in a discussion will win it. That's true everywhere but marriage. In reality, <laughs> though, everywhere else, he or she who frames the issue will win the exchange. And by winning, I don't mean that you beat someone into submission and shame them. I mean you have the better argument. So here's how trot out the toddler works, and then we'll practice it together. Suppose somebody did come to you and say, well, why don't you trust women to make their own personal decisions? Why do you always want to invade their privacy by telling them what they can and cannot do? You've all heard this a million times. Instead of panicking, the first thing that ought to run through your head is, would this work as a good argument for killing a toddler? If the answer is no, what are they assuming about the unborn that they're not assuming about the toddler? That the unborn aren't human. So the first words out of your mouth, you're going to love this. The first words out of your mouth are, pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me, and hold your hand out at about knee-high to help them illustrate it, okay? Help them picture it. Pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want us to trust them to make their own personal decisions about roughing him up in the privacy of the bedroom. Should we allow them to do that? What's the answer going to be? No, you can't do that. Your reply will be two words. Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Your reply should be one word, said melodically. Ah, some of you will do that better than me when I sing things die, but you get the idea. Ah, ah what? If the unborn are human like that toddler, should we kill them in the name of trusting people any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? Well, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Ah, you may be right. You may, in fact, be right. However, you first got to demonstrate the unborn aren't human before you can argue that we can kill them. Now, what have I done there? Have I even argued for the pro-life view yet? No. For all you know, I support abortion. But I have framed the issue around the question, what is the unborn? And at the street level, where most of us live, this is the assumption that gets in the way of being an effective pro-life communicator. People just assume the unborn aren't human, and we don't challenge that assumption. We let it go. So let's try one together. Somebody comes to you and says, okay, well, what are you going to do about all these poor women? Look, I got a mother over here. She's got 11 kids by 11 different fathers, and now she's pregnant with a 12th. 
She can't afford the 11 kids she's got. And you want to force her to bring a 12th child into this world that she can't afford to feed? You really want to do that? Stop right there. What was just assumed about the unborn? That they're not human. By the way, that will be the answer every time I ask the question. Notice, we believe she already has a child, right? The only question is, what's she going to do with him? They're assuming she doesn't have a child. Bring a child into the world? No, she's already got a child in the world. The question is, what is she going to do with him? So let's trot out our toddler. I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents already have 11 kids. They can't afford to feed a 12th. They want to be able to balance the checkbook at the end of the month by executing the toddler. Should we allow them to do that? What's the answer going to be? No, you can't do that. Your reply? Not all. Some of you are too anxious. I could just see it in your faces. You were just ready to come up. Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Ah. Ah what? Not aha. Ah. If the unborn are human like that toddler, should we intentionally kill them to help someone's economic problem any more than we'd kill a toddler for that reason? Oh, but that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. You might be right but you're going to have to demonstrate the unborn aren't human. You can't just assume it. Is everybody with me on this so far? Everybody see the problem? Sir, do you have a brother? What's his name? Robert. Robert. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Have you stopped beating your brother Robert yet? Yes. You have. <laughs> How did that happen? Through prayer, deliverance? What, what brought that about? My father beat me. Your father beat you. <laughs> That's the best answer I've ever heard to this question. (laughs) Would you all extend your hands to this dear brother? We're going to pray over him. Now, was that a fair question? Was my question fair? What did I assume? That he beats his brother. How much evidence did I give you that he beats his brother? By the way, everybody I pick on, I reward So I'm going to give you a free copy of my debate with the ACLU president on abortion at Wayne State University. Who else would like to get picked on today? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. So uh, do see me in the break, and we will make allowance for that at at some point. Um, Notice, I simply assumed he beats his brother, provided zero evidence whatsoever. This is the problem we face, men and women, and you need to become very adept at trotting out your toddler. Virtually every objection at the street level assumes the unborn aren't human. For example, here's another one. Well, why do you want to force your morality on everyone? Stop right there. Typical pro-lifer goes, well, I'm not trying to force anything. Oh, yes, you are. You're mean-spirited. You want to take away people's choices. Stop right there. Pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want to kill him in their own home, and they don't think anybody should force their own moral views on what they want to do. Should they be allowed to go ahead with that? No, they can't do that. What's your answer? Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Ah, if the unborn are human like that toddler, we shouldn't be killing them in the name of not forcing morality. Well, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Ah, you may be right, but you first got to show the unborn aren't human. You can't just assume it. In other words, all we're doing is flushing that assumption out into the open where it can be dealt with, where it can be examined and discussed. You want to be talking about the issue, what is the unborn? You want to start with that question. Now, I realize, and we'll deal with this a little later, there are academic arguments out there that concede the unborn are human and say we can kill them anyway. But the vast majority of people you're going to interact with do not hold that view. They simply assume the unborn aren't human just the way the governor did. That's exactly how they think. And our job is to force them to examine the question, what is the unborn? Okay, I've raised the issue, now I'm going to answer it. What is the unborn? I'm about to shock you. We are not going to go to the Bible to get our answer. In fact, that's the wrong place to go to answer the question, what is the unborn? So not only have I insulted the bills, I've now identified myself as a total heretic. Is that right? No. (laughs) Bear with me. 
What kind of question is, what is the unborn? A philosophical question or an empirical question? Empirical. If you go home this evening and you look out your back window and there's a four-legged critter running across your, your block wall, do you go to the Bible to figure out what it is or your biology textbook? Your biology textbook. Now, the question of how we ought to value living things is a theological question, and we will do Bible later, but not yet. We first need to answer the question, what kind of thing are we dealing with? And we're going to go to the science of embryology to answer that question. So here is what the science of embryology teaches in one sentence. I'm going to summarize it for you in one sentence. And by the way, the medical sources that back up what I'm about to tell you are in your notes. Because your notes are so thorough and so good and so excellent that they're amazing. And if you get the package deal out there as well, you'll be omniscient on this topic, okay? Now, here is the science of embryology. From the earliest stages of development, meaning from the one cell stage, you were a distinct living and whole human being. You were distinct in that you were not part of the mother. You had your own DNA, often a different blood type, at least half the time a different gender. Uh, you're distinct. You're not part of her body. You reside in it, but you're not part of it. You're living because we know dead things don't grow, right? And you're a whole human being, meaning that you're, you're, even though you're immature, even though you have yet to grow, the kind of thing you are is not under dispute. Everybody hold up your hand like this, and I want you to pinch yourself real hard on the back of your hand. Give yourself a really good pinch. Wives, if your husband is not participating, grab skin cells off the back of his neck. Okay, give yourself a good pinch. All right, congratulations. You just sent a couple of hundred somatic cells hurling to their deaths on the lap in front of you. And the news gets even worse. Every one of those cells you just killed contains your entire DNA encoding. Did you just commit mass homicide? To the dude doing this, I have very good news for you right now. <laughs> you did not. These cells on the back of your hand are merely part of a larger human being, you. They are not distinct whole human beings the way you were at the embryonic stage, the way I was at the embryonic stage. There is a difference in kind between bodily cells that are mere parts of larger human entities and the distinct whole living human embryo at the one cell stage. Is everybody with me so far on the basic science of this? So what, what are some things people say in response to this? Because it seems like our case is really straightforward. Hey, you have a distinct living whole human being from fertilization forward. Why do people not just jump right on this? There are a few reasons why, some of them legit, some of them not. Let me go through some of the common objections and tell you why people don't connect with this. The first is they throw out objections that uh, they think are persuasive but really aren't. And they'll say something like this, well, what about twinning? Why, that embryo can split into two. Up till 21 days after fertilization, that embryo could split into two, and now we've got two embryos. So how can you say that from fertilization forward, you got a distinct whole living human being when that embryo can split into two? Question, how does it follow that because a living entity splits into two, that it wasn't a whole living entity prior to the split? Have anybody, has anybody in this room sliced a flatworm in half? Can I see your hands? The mass killers are now identifying themselves, okay? <laughs> Sir, what did you get when you sliced that flatworm in half? Two flatworms. Did it follow there was no flatworm prior to the split? So the fact that a living entity may split does not mean it wasn't a whole living entity prior to the split. Here's another objection you'll get. People will say, well, women don't grieve miscarriages the way they grieve the deaths of newborns and toddlers. Now, what do we all know to be true? Many women do grieve, right? 
We know that, and that's true. And by the way, for any of you that are in the room that have walked through miscarriage, you know how painful this is. It is no walk in the park. But I want to just sidestep that question for a moment. It's true, women do grieve miscarriages. Many do. But suppose they didn't. How do my feelings about something change what it is? Suppose during the break, I get a text alerting me that one of my own children has just died. Would I feel worse about that than hearing that 500 children died in India today from malnutrition? I'm going to feel worse about hearing what? About my own kid. Does it follow my own kid is more human and valuable than those kids in India? No, it just means I have a stronger emotional connection to my own child. It says nothing about the humanity of the others. My feelings about something don't change what it is. And the funny thing is, I've heard this argument at the highest levels. When President Bush had his bioethics uh, council back in 2002 to 2008, there were members of that council that argued that embryos could be destroyed for research because nobody grieves their deaths the way they grieve the deaths of newborns and toddlers. We're talking advanced philosophers making this argument. And it's foolish. Here's another objection you'll get. Why, Christian, you're opposed to abortion? Really? How can you be opposed to abortion when nature and maybe even your God, is responsible for millions of them every year. Why, up to a third of all pregnancies spontaneously abort. How can you be concerned about abortion when nature, or maybe even your God, appears to be the biggest abortionist in the universe? Question. How does it follow that because nature spontaneously triggers a miscarriage that A, the embryos in question are not human, or B, we may intentionally kill them? Earthquakes happen in third world countries and wipe out hundreds of thousands of people because the building codes are terrible. Does that justify mass murder? Disease wipes out a bunch of people every year. Does that justify killing people who are sick? In other words, because nature does something, tells me nothing about whether I can intentionally do it. This is an example of the is-ought fallacy, saying that because something is the case, we ought to be able to just go ahead and do it. And it simply doesn't follow. Here's another one you'll get. This was very popular two years ago. A comedian by the name of Tomlinson, his first name escapes me. This comedian, whatever his name was, first name, said, pro-lifers, I've got a slam dunk argument that totally destroys your argument against abortion. Totally destroys it, and I've come up with this. He was lying. There'd actually been four pro-abortion philosophers that came up with this example uh, 20 years before he ever did. He didn't credit him, so we already know he's a plagiarist. Uh, And so he says to us, I have got a knockdown argument that will beat everybody's. You're in a burning research lab. The building's an inferno. And this corner over here, there are a thousand frozen embryos. In that corner back there by the sound booth, there's a six-year-old girl. You only have time to save either the thousand frozen embryos or the six-year-old girl. Who are you going to save? Where are we all going? We're all going to save the six-year-old. And he comes back, Mr. Plagiarist, and says, see, even you don't believe your own argument. Because if you did, you would at least consider that maybe the thousand embryos ought to be saved over that six-year-old girl. Question. How does it follow that because I save one human over others, that the ones left behind are not fully human? 
Pretend this building is on fire. It's an inferno. I can save all of you or my daughter, Emily Rose. Who is going to toast? Yeah, all of you. <laughs> Does it follow that you're less human than my daughter because I save her first? No. By the way, his whole thought experiment falls apart. Here's why. Is abortion about who we ought to save or who we get to intentionally kill? Which is it? Who we get to kill. His thought experiment doesn't address that at all. I'm going to save my daughter first, but I'm not going to shoot you on the way out. In other words, he is using a thought experiment that doesn't speak to the morality of abortion at all. It may speak to the question who we ought to save, but it gives us no permission whatsoever about who we can intentionally kill. The whole thing is wrong-headed from the beginning. By the way, will the Secret Service take a bullet for the president? Will it take one for you? No. Does it follow the president is more human than you are because the Secret Service will take a bullet for him but not you? By the way, the Secret Service will let a whole city fry in their efforts to save the president. If Washington, D.C. comes under nuke attack, they're getting the president out of there and they're going to leave all of us there to fry. Does it follow the president is more human? No, it means the, the catastrophic consequences of losing him for the nation are greater than losing you, so they save him first. It says nothing about the value or humanity of those left behind. This is a bogus argument. There is, however, one argument that I think we can relate to. And if we're honest, we ought to admit, yeah, I, can, I sort of can feel that too. And it goes like this. Somebody says, okay, pro-lifer, I understand what you're saying. I get that you think this embryo is a whole human being. I get that you believe from fertilization forward it's one of us. However, I mean, come on. You look at a picture of an early embryo, four or five cells. You can't even see it without a microscope. And I just don't connect to that being a baby, a human, like my cute cousin Abigail. Now, can we admit that that at least seems to have some intuitive force to us? I mean, have you ever seen a picture of an early embryo? It's a ball of cells. At least that's what it looks like. But sometimes, men and women, our intuitions are mistaken. Intuitions, I don't mean a hunch. I mean things that appear immediately true to us that we shouldn't have to argue for, like murder is wrong, like rape is wrong. You don't need an argument. You don't need a syllogism to show those are wrong. You either recognize them immediately as being wrong or something's wrong with your moral compass, right? In the same way, people sometimes look at that early embryo and they think it's self-evidently not one of us. Their intuitions don't go there because it doesn't look like their cute little cousin. Here's a way you can illustrate, though, that sometimes our, our, our intuitions are, are off base. To borrow an example from Richard Stiff, I want you to pretend that we are back in 1970 and you are on a safari in Mexico. Now, for all of you in the room that are under the age of 40, I need to bring you up to speed on a little history. There was a time when we did not take pictures with our phones. We had these devices called cameras. Cameras were square little gizmos like this. They had a shutter that would open up. Light would come through the shutter and record the image on the film. And the way it would work is, when you shot 36 exposures and not a moment before, you would very carefully remove the film from the camera, preferably in a darker area. You'd put it in a little canister, pop the lid on it, then you would drive to the far corner of the neighborhood supermarket parking lot where there was a little yellow shack called Photomat. <laughs> you would drop your film off. You would wait a month and a half for your pictures to come back, <laughs> half of them overexposed. <laughs> Do I preach gospel truth? Yes. By the way, back then, we did not take pictures of our food. I 
I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the late, well, actually, I think it was the mid-60s. You may correct me if I'm wrong on this. The Polaroid camera emerged. Now, the, some of you are going, I got a Polaroid camera now. It's really cool looking. It's slick. Not the original ones. They look like a contraption Satan had designed. But they had, a dis, they had a distinct advantage. You shoot your picture. It would spit out the piece of paper. Some of you are doing the muscle memory already. <laughs> You'd shake it for two minutes, and your picture emerged right in front of you. I want you to pretend it's 1970. You are on a Mexican safari. You have just shot a picture with your Polaroid camera of a black jaguar leaping across the trail in front of us. Now, for those of you that don't know, black jaguars are almost never filmed. They're one place in the world, Central America and, and Mexican jungles. You shot that picture. You captured it. You're breathlessly waiting for the picture to emerge because you know National Geographic is going to pay you huge bucks for this. And while you're trembling with anticipation, I come up behind you, I rip the camera out of your hands, I yank the picture out of it, and I tear it up. Are you angry at me? Yes. You're going to kill me even if you are pro-life. <laughs> what if I said, why are you so upset? Why, I didn't see a jaguar there in that picture. All I saw was a white paper with a brown smudge on it. You would look at me incredulous and you would say, are you crazy? The jaguar in the picture was already there. We just couldn't see him because he was still developing. From the one cell stage, men and women, you were already there. We just couldn't see you because you were still developing. That's the science of embryology. But there is another reason people don't get this. And it's more sinister. It's not that they don't know the facts of embryology. It's that they don't know the facts and don't want to know them. It's ignorance sustained by denial. How do we reach people that have come to the conclusion that moral truth on abortion is no different than choosing chocolate ice cream over vanilla? You have your preference, I have mine, who are we to judge? How do we reach those people to reawaken their moral intuitions to help them see abortion as a moral truth issue? And the answer is we give them a chance to view what's actually at stake in this debate. If you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, can I see your hands? Oh, okay, most of you. Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, Hacksaw Ridge. By the way, I met Desmond Doss when I was 11, but I'll talk about that later, maybe. Every one of you that just raised your hand, and I think it was nearly 100% on, on at least one of those films, every one of you paid money to go see incredibly gruesome imagery. Think about that for a moment. And not only that, you, many of you took your kids, like I took my kids to see those films. Why? Why did you pay money for that? I'll tell you why. In the case of your kids, you wanted them to see this when they were old enough because you knew that there were some things that words alone are powerless to convey, that they simply defy explanation with words alone. And the abortion issue is no different. There are millions of Americans who will continue to think of it as a mere preference issue, like choosing chocolate over vanilla until they see it. There's also millions of Americans in our churches who say they oppose abortion, but they're not lifting a finger to stop it because they're not heartbroken over this issue. And they will remain not heartbroken until they see it. In just a moment, we're going to roll for you a short clip. It's 55 seconds. This is a clip 
that I show when I debate my friend Nadine Strawson, the former president of the ACLU. She is a friend. I like her. She's just wrong on the issue. But we show this clip when I debate her. We are going to show this clip when myself and my speaking team, starting in the fall of, two th of this year through spring of 2020, we're going to reach 10,000 students in the state of New York with a pro-life apologetics presentation in Catholic and Protestant high schools. <clears throat> a month ago, I met in Utica, New York, with a church there, Redeemer Church in Utica. They personally stepped up and said, we're going to fund this if we have to do it ourselves. But that night, we went out to dinner with a group of six people, the pastor of the church, Michael Cervello, and myself, and we met with these six people. We needed $25,000 to get this project done. We raised $20,000 that night to get it done. And if we get $50,000, we're going to reach 20,000 students in this state. That's how it's going to work. My speaking team and I are going to spread out. This is what we do at LTI. We speak on pro-life apologetics issues. We don't do abstinence talks. We don't do chastity talks, though we support groups that do. We go into these schools and do assemblies, show this video, and give them reasons why the pro-life position is true. That's what we do. And we're going to do this in New York. And Governor Cuomo, you got another thing coming if you think we're just going to lay down and be silent on this issue. We're going to roll this clip in a minute. Before I do, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, if you're here and you don't want to watch it, let me tell you exactly what's in it so you can make up your own mind if you want to watch or not watch. The clip does not show an abortion from start to finish, but it does show you the aftermath of a first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester abortion. And I want to warn you, it's gruesome viewing. Secondly, if you want to avoid its contents, we've made it real easy for you. You can simply look away. There's no narration in the clip, only instrumental music. I will not narrate the clip. I will not describe what's on the, 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 the screen. Thirdly, please hear me. I know for a fact there are men and women listening to me right now. And for you to even be here today has taken tremendous courage because for you, abortion is anything but abstract. And I don't know if I'm talking to a man who encouraged a girl to abort or a woman who made that choice because you didn't think you had a way out. We are not here to condemn you today. Pastor Pat is not here to condemn you today. I am not here to condemn you today. And I'm going to tell you why, because that can almost sound like we're just trying to gloss over things here. Oh, we don't want you to feel guilt. We're not saying that without a solid foundation for saying that. Here is the solid foundation. The solid foundation is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ not only declares sinners not guilty, it explains why all of us in this room today have a big problem. Many of us have read the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we think we get it. Oh yeah, you know, we should be nice to people in need. That parable is about, you know, giving our our resources to help a neighbor in need, and, and yeah, we want to certainly be like that. If that's your view of that parable, you do not understand that parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan, go home and read it tonight, it should ruin your week. Because a lawyer says to Jesus, what do I got to do to be saved? That's what the parable's about, salvation. It's not about social justice. And, he sa and Jesus says to the guy, well, what does the law say? And the lawyer answers right. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and might, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, do that and you will, and you will live. Terrifying words. And then the, neighbor seeking to, or the lawyer seeking to justify himself looks at Jesus and says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know what that parable teaches? This is the part that should ruin our day. Look what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't give the man the gospel because he was seeking to justify himself. He gives him the law and then tells him what the law means in terms of loving your neighbor. Flawless self-sacrifice for a complete stranger. That's what it means to love your neighbor. Flawless self-sacrifice 
for a neighbor who hates you. Jews hated Samaritans, remember that? It gets worse. Flawless giving of your own money to do whatever the man needs to care for his needs for as long as it takes. That means taking your American Express card, maxing it out, and then maxing out the next three you got. As much as needed. And flawless giving of your time. Staying with the man all night, bandaging up his wounds, putting him on your own donkey, meaning translation, give it, you know, cart him all over town to take care of him. And let me ask a question. Who among us loves like that? We don't love our spouses that way, let alone a complete stranger. You know what that parable teaches, men and women? Every one of us in this room today has a huge problem. We do not love our unborn neighbor the way the law of God requires. Mother Teresa fails that test. I fail that test. You fail that test. There's only one hope for us. And it's found in Romans 3, where Paul says, but now, oh, I love those words in Scripture. But now, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been revealed. You know what that means? God looks at sinners and he doesn't make them righteous. How many of us as Christians have just become perfect since we become believers, right? You know what that means? God does not make us righteous. He declares us righteous in virtue of Jesus. So if you're here today and you've had an experience with abortion, you know what will make you right with God? Not your good stuff, which will never make up for your bad stuff. What makes you right with God is that Jesus stood in your place, condemned, bearing the judgment of God every one of us in this room deserves. He stands in our place condemned, takes the judgment we deserve so that those who trust in Jesus for salvation are declared not guilty. That's incredible news. But that's not the end of it. Sorry for preaching, but this is important stuff. It gets better. God raises Jesus from the dead, proving that his sacrifice was sufficient. But, here's more good news. Those who trust in Jesus for salvation, please hear me on this. God the Father is no longer your judge. He's your dad, and he's adopted you into his family as a dearly loved child. Because Jesus took the rap you and I deserved and lived the perfect life you and I have not. And when God judges you, if you're in Christ, guess what? The sins of the believer are not reckoned against the believer because God looks at Jesus and judges you on his record, not your own. So when we look at this film, we are not showing it to beat up on people who've had abortions. We're showing it to get truth out to a culture that thinks abortion truth is like ice cream truth. You have your preference, I have mine. This film reawakens moral intuitions. So just before we go to the break, we're going to go ahead and roll this film. And if you wish to look away, you feel the freedom to look away. We don't want anybody to feel you're being forced or coerced to look at this. It's 55 seconds. It's your decision. I don't think there's any small children in the room under the age of seventh grade. If there are parents, encourage your child to look down during the brief time during this clip, unless you're okay with them watching. So without any delay, we'll go ahead and roll this this clip. Some of you might look at a clip like this and think, do we really need to show something like this to make our point? Couldn't we just show the nice baby pictures, the ultrasound images, and couldn't we just go with an easier way than than doing this? And by the way, if you feel that, I'm sympathetic to you because you have no idea how much I hate having a job where I go around and show these pictures. But I'll tell you why it's necessary. If you look at the history of social reform movements in the last 
150 years, there's not one of them that has succeeded without the use of disturbing imagery to convey truths the culture would rather ignore. Not one. I'll give you an example. In 1955, an African-American boy by the name of Emmett Till Jr., 14 years of age, journeyed from Chicago where he was living to visit his cousin in the town of Money, Mississippi. He gets off the train in Money, Mississippi and begins to brag to his cousin and the cousin's friends about his two white girlfriends back in Chicago. The cousin says, you're a liar, that's bunk, we don't believe you, uh, you do not have two white girlfriends, we don't even speak to white women here, we don't even make eye contact with them, let alone date them. And Emmett said, yeah, I do have two white girlfriends. So the cousin and the friend said, okay, hotshot, we dare you to talk to a white girl down here. That afternoon, they go into Brian's grocery store. And Emmett walks up to the counter, that 14-year-old boy, to purchase a piece of gum from a 21-year-old white married woman behind the counter. He flashes her a big smile and very innocently but flirtatiously says something like, thanks, babe, and leaves. That's the gist of what he did. Now, we think, no big deal. Very big deal in 1955 if you were black and you did that. Two nights later, Emmett is taken at gunpoint from his uncle's home where he was spending the summer by the woman's husband and another man. At gunpoint, they extract him, take him out to a wooded rural area outside Money, Mississippi, and after savagely beating him and breaking nearly every bone in his upper torso for five hours, they finish him off with a shot to the head and throw his corpse into the river. When the local sheriff discovers this boy's corpse, presumably three to four days later, he cannot believe what he's looking at. He had never seen a human corpse so mangled. He put what was left of Emmett in a box, not even a coffin, just a wooden box that he nailed shut and put a note on it to Mamie Till, Emmett's mother, which read, do not open this, you will not like what you see. When Mamie Till got the body back in Chicago, the newspaper press gathered around her and said, what are you going to do, Mrs. Till? And she shocked the world with an announcement. She said, we're going to have a funeral for my son. It's going to be public, and it's going to be an open casket funeral. The newspaper press went berserk. You cannot do this. Do you realize the condition your boy is in? Do you realize how people will get upset? She said, I know but I want the whole world to see what they did to my boy. And that black and white photo of Emmett Till, which you can Google when you go home tonight, be warned, it's grisly. That black and white photo launched the civil rights movement in this country. Three months later, Rosa Parks is told to go to the back of the bus because she's black in Montgomery. What gave her the courage to stand her ground? She told us in her memoirs. I couldn't get the picture of that boy out of my head. What boy? Emmett. Why do we show pictures like this, men and women? Why is it essential that pro-life Christians do this? I'll tell you why. Because I'm convinced that if pro-life Christians don't lovingly but truthfully open the casket on abortion, our nation is going to continue to tolerate an injustice it never has to look at. But as Christians, at the same time we open the casket on abortion, we open the truth of God's word that sinners can be declared righteous in virtue of what Jesus did for them on Calvary. We give truth and we give hope. That's why a Christian pro-life message is a winning message. It's redemptive. It exposes truth and then provides the antidote. Listen, whatever church you came from today, never buy the line that abortion is a distraction from the gospel. No. And here's how I know that. When you make sin real to people, what do they need at that moment? The antidote, a savior. You've got one. Abortion can point people to their need for Jesus especially in a culture that thinks truth and right and wrong are just a bunch of mixed-up relativism. We have the antidote that they're looking for. 
in the gospel of Jesus. Okay, we're getting ready to take our break. Where is the man who has the, oh, you, you've got the product, right? Can I see that stuff real quick? Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah, I'll take your phone while you're at it because it looks better than mine. All right, we're about to take a break, and uh, some of you I know are just thinking, well, what does he have back there at his product table? And I know you're asking that question, so I thought I would tell you what I got back there. We are offering something today at a discount. This is called our Pro-Life Apologetics Pack. And I don't know how many of them we got back there, but I think there's enough at least for the, the, you know, maybe a few of you. Now, there should be enough, I hope, to get back there and get this. Here's what you get. You get, first of all, our television series, Life is Best. This is aired on the National Religious Broadcasters Network. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, this is myself and my speaking team, the same speaking team that goes into schools that will be up here working. You watch us go on secular university campuses and interact with students on pro-life, abortion, and the gospel. And you watch how to convey your pro-life truths in one-on-one -on -one conversations, how to take what you're learning here, and you actually see us illustrate it for you. We also teach you how to do pro-life apologetics. 13 episodes, 29 minutes each. So if you have a Sunday school class or a small group ministry at your church and you want to equip your church to be on board with this pro-life apologetic stuff, this is your resource right here. We also have in that pack my book, uh, Case for Life. This is the textbook for learning how to defend what you believe on the issue. And there's also review questions at the back of each chapel. Chapel. I'm going to go to Spetch therapy after this. Um, <laughs> questions at the back of each chapter to help you master the material, or if you want to lead a small group on it, you, you've got questions there. We also have our book, Stand for Life, that I co-authored with my friend John Enzer. This is great for students to help them learn a biblically-based pro-life apologetic. And finally, we're going to throw in a DVD, not a CD, a DVD, of me debating the former president of the ACLU, my friend Nadine Strawson, at Wayne State University, a secular university, uh, and you'll get to watch that debate. Put the popcorn in, have a good evening. We're, we're making all of this available to you. It's $60 while they last. If you want to uh, buy things individually, they have the prices back there as well. So at this point, uh, we're actually going to end a few minutes early in this session because I believe in ending early. I do not like to run over. Uh, do, are you making any announcements? Uh, do I turn that over to you? So I'll turn it over to you for, for right now. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So we're going to take a 15-minute break. Um, at about 10 minutes, the worship team is going to come back up and play a song. Uh, come on back in. So just a reminder that the prayer room is open. If you'd like to receive prayer, it's right out, out the doors to the right. Uh, the bathrooms are right down the hall. There are also uh, our bathrooms down the hall and to the right where all of our youth classrooms are. If you want to go down there and check out that area, that's fine. We do have another event in our youth wing, uh, so please respect that and, and um, don't disrupt that area, but you can go down there to see the classrooms and to the bathrooms. Um, and there's refreshments out in the foyer, so we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.